Open my lips that my mouth might show forth your praise. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Here he comes, Odd. My mother's name was Audrey, but my father called her Odd in the same way that my grandfather called my grandmother Odd. You could say that Odd runs in our family. Here he comes, Odd. My father would groan or sigh as he heard my little feet sprinting down the hallway from my bedroom to theirs every night. We lived in a big old five bedroom Victorian house and the hallway that I would dash down was more of a balcony or an overlook than a hallway because it overlooked a central staircase that came up from the hall down below, first to one landing and then to another and then to a, the, up to the top of the stairs. And you have to imagine the setting here. It's hardwood floors everywhere. And we had mahogany paneling on the walls and the ceiling was two stories up. And along the hallway I was running was this substantial banister to keep you, of course, from falling 20 feet to blow. But you could look from that banister out through a whole bank of windows onto the backyard. So the sound of my feet stampeding down the hall sounded like a bunch of people running down the hall. Or, to my mind, it sounded like the closet monster was after me. You see, I too was afraid of the dark. And every night, I would lie there in my big high bed. Now, I still have that bed, and now I know that the bed only comes up to about here. So I can just sit down on it. But back then, I had to climb up into it. And in my room, I had a bureau and a desk and a chair, and I had some pictures on the wall, and I had the banner from the 1967 Red Sox. But in the corner, there was a closet. And I didn't always close the door properly, so it stood ajar. And it was pretty dark in my room at night. I don't even know if nightlights had been invented in 1968, but I certainly didn't have one. I had a lot of windows, so the stars and the moon from outside would come through the window. And sometime the Petersons who lived over the hedge might leave a nightlight on out in the yard, and I'd see that. But it was absolutely pitch black in my closet. And I could see that darkness as I peeked out from underneath my blankets. And that darkness was all I could see. It was like a magnet drawing my eyes towards the darkness. I could not look away. And lying there in my bed with my teddy bear, I could feel my heart racing. Imagining the danger that lurked in there just waiting to burst out on me. You know, this word imagine is we, we form an image. And I can remember, it's wild, it's almost 60 years ago now, I can see those shadows becoming some sort of monstrous beast. And when I couldn't take it anymore, I'd leap out of bed and run as fast as I could toward the open door to my parents' bedroom. I think back, and it's been 40 years since I've been in that house. It was probably only 30 feet. But when you're three or four, you know how it feels like 100 yards? Here he comes, Odd. My father would sigh, and he would roll over on his side. And when I hit the threshold of their room, I would leap like Superman, the old-fashioned Superman, and take off and fly into the space that he had left in the middle and scoot down under the covers into the safety and warmth and familiarity and the smell of my parents and fall fast asleep. And I'd always wake up the next morning magically back in my own bed. Now, part of outgrowing those childhood fears of the dark, part of growing up, is outgrowing those childhood fears of the dark. But we have to admit, they linger, don't they? We see someone standing in a doorway downtown. Well, the scary part is we can't quite see them, right? We know someone's there. Or you're walking down the street, 
And you hear some walking behind you, and you're too scared to turn around to look to see what it is. Or like Kayla, well, actually, she didn't hear it. She felt it. But if you're home alone at night, and you hear strange noises in the house, that's why it's so effective in movies, the danger that could be lurking in the dark. And I think it's the deprivation of our sight. It supercharges the amygdala, which is the part of your brain back here, this reptilian part of our brain that says either fight or flee. But we all know there's another part of growing up. And that's we get curious. We get intrigued. We even become determined to go to those scary places, to visit the dark places of life, the places we haven't seen but we've only heard about from one or two friends who are a little on the shady side. The places outside the safety of our parents. The places that might just scare us a little bit or a lot. I don't know how you were in your teens or your 20s, but part of being a teenager in your 20s is you try touching the proverbial hot stove. Or you try grabbing the proverbial live wire. Or you try putting your fingers in the proverbial dangerous machinery. And you say, oh, that didn't burn, sting, or crush quite as much as my mother said it would. Let's try it some more. Let's try a little harder. Let's try something else. And we all end up getting burned, stung, or crushed by life. And we also end up no longer children. Or do we? The great spiritual crisis I see in the world is not a lack of a belief in a God like ours. And it's not a lack of participation in religious organizations like our church. And it's not a lack of moral or ethical behavior as taught by religious organizations like our church. No, I think it's the way it's always been. It's the same crisis. Most of us, or all of us, remain spiritually children. We never really grow up. We're fixated on and fascinated by our fears. And in turn, we create a fear-based, fear-driven society. So many of us spend all of our waking and dreaming hours spiritually running away from or helter-skelter toward the very things that scare us. Like me, in my bed, couldn't help but look at that dark closet. Or if you drive down Route 24 and there's been an accident, everyone slows down to look. They want to know all the gory details on the news that night. Makes us cry and shudder at home until we come to the next accident and then we do it all again. We're like moths to the flame of fear. As we heard in our psalm this morning, faith is supposed to be an antidote or an alternative to fear. Like me diving into my parents' bed, but not to pull the covers over our heads. You see, that's the way it's been taught. Just join the church, they'll say, Max Olmsted. And you know, you might have noticed that each church claims to be the church, as in the right church, even though there's a whole bunch of different kinds of churches. Just do what we say, Max Olmsted. Just believe what we teach, Max Olmsted. Trust that this is right. Hope in heaven when you die, and by God, Max Ohm said, stay away from the darkness out there. In here is the light. You'll be safe. But God and Jesus want us to go out into the world that God so loved, right? To embrace the world exactly the way it is. To face the things that are fearful, the people with whom we disagree, even our enemies, Right? So how do we overcome our fear? The image of my parents' bed. Not as a refuge, because when you think about refuge, that's a fear-based way of looking at things. But a light in the darkness. The light of love and beauty. 
And I'm convinced that the best way to unplug from our fears is to turn to beauty. Someone, something, someplace beautiful. And that's something all of us can do, no matter where we are. In the earlier meditation, I asked you all to visualize beauty in your life. And I know it's tricky because we all have different life experiences. Whether it was your mother or your father or your grandfather father or your nanny or someone who loved you and looked down at you at the crib, if you can bring it back. Or when you had your own kid and you just looked at them. You know, you just sat there and looked at them. Or when you fell in love and all of a sudden it was like you were in Mary Poppins and everything was technicolor. Or your dog, for dog owners here, right? They just look at you and it's like, my God. Or how your soul felt when you were witnessing something beautiful, whether you were looking at a piece of art or hearing a piece of music or you were at a place or at a wedding or a baptism. The moments in your life when you felt like you were in the immediate presence of God and the Holy. It just was. But it doesn't have to be that. It can be the silent majesty of the ordinary. Home. Home. And the people sitting around the table having a meal. Now it's time for the quote. I often turn to a man named John O'Donohue for words for this kind of thing. And John O'Donohue writes that each of, us, each of us is responsible for how we see. And how we see determines what we see. Seeing is not merely a physical act. The heart of vision is shaped by the state of the soul. When the soul is alive to beauty, we begin to see life in a fresh and vital way. So when Linda read that scripture this morning to us about the light and the darkness and good and evil and judgment and so on, the judgment's not God. The judgment is that we ourselves choose darkness and fear, even though we know that there's something else. And we create a world of darkness and fear. It's a simple message, my friends, but that's why we're here. To prepare our souls to be shaped for beauty. To shape our souls for beauty rather than fear. So that we might go from this place, taking that vision of beauty into the world so that others might see as we see. And together we might create that sort of a world. May it be so. Amen.